Greetings, it is I, the Great One himself, founder of the Seneca Libertarian Society, C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com on the interwebs. Ten years of podcasting, ten years of being right, ten years of never being wrong, ten years of not giving a fuck about your feelings. We're on the Twitterverse, at C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C. In the control room over there, the lovely and adorable Randy. It is Monday morning here in the People's Republic, and it is the 13th of, what month is this? July. Yeah, I got a lot of shit to talk about. That's why I'm trying to get everything rolling, get that shit out of the way. Randy, where the fuck are my notes? Don't let me forget about the video. Because I will. You can scream and shout with all your might. Oh, you can scream, shout, whine, cry, snivel, piss, and motherfucking moan. Dig in your heels and hold on tight. You can shove your opinion up your ass. That way Obama's cock has something to keep it company. Notes. Don't forget the ever-present, the most likely, the third possibility that's never been wrong yet. You are wrong, and I am right. So go fuck yourself. Yeah, found them. That was a joke. I'm not organized. This is Stating the Obvious. It is the weapons platform from which I launched the cruise missing my intellect that homes in on and destroys stupid motherfuckers. All around the fucking world, if you're a goddamn status, I have a big giant dick you can suck. While you're sucking on my dick, you can go, Oh, but, mm, who will build the road? Mm, 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 who, mm, road, roads. You can suck my dick, you just fucking swallow gallons of cum, and the whole time you can be asking me who's going to build the fucking roads. Oh, and then I got to remember out the Maddox thing. Okay, I don't know if I'm going to do this or not. I talked, actually, I think it was in the previous episode, I talked about, oh, God, dog spelled backwards, God, at C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com. That's the email address if you want to get in touch with me or Randy, if you want to send us bitching and complaining, you want to call us names. You want to insult me, you want to send me material for the show, you want to send me pictures of yourself naked, especially if you're a hot volleyball girl, or if you want to send Randy pictures of yourself naked if you're a nice big hunky guy, whatever the fuck you want to send, you can fucking send it. There's no censorship here. And remember, anything you send to the show, any comments left on the website, any email you send me, belongs to me, and it may show up on the show, so if you're going to get your feelings hurt, don't fucking send it. Same thing goes to YouTube comments. i got to talk about YouTube comments sometime. All right. I talked about... The Biggest Problem in the Universe podcast, which is fucking hilarious. Still recommend you listen to it. Maddox and Dick Masterson. So anyhow, a couple, and I'm with everything. I'm always way behind. I'm like 10 episodes behind the episodes that have actually been released. So I listened to an episode, and Dick brought in the problem of earthquakes. He said earthquakes were a bad thing. Okay, Maddox argued back that earthquakes are not a bad thing because earthquakes destroy buildings and then you have to rebuild the buildings and this stimulates the economy. Well, needless to say, the next show, Maddox, come, Maddox shows up and says, yeah, all these assholes sent me emails about the broken window fallacy and the broken window fallacy is a fallacy. And Maddox launches into this pathetic, incredibly statist defense of why, no, the broken, broken window fallacy is actually a fallacy, and it's good for the economy. And so I'm considering, do I want to isolate the sound bits of Maddox's arguments as to why the broken window fallacy isn't a fallacy? And basically he made the argument that war and earthquakes and other forms of destruction are in fact good for the economy. You know, the same argument that every fucking statist out there makes. The George Bush argument, right? And of course, 9-11 was a great thing because it stimulated the economy. You know, according to Maddox, that World War II was a wonderful thing because, because of World War II, we now have microwave ovens. And this is statist thinking, right? Yeah, six billion Jews exterminated. Eh, who gives a fuck? I got a microwave oven. I mean, that right there is the epitome of statism. You want to sum up statism in a nutshell, it's that attitude right there. Six billion Jews, gypsies, and homosexuals exterminated, thrown in mass graves. 
But hey, Maddox got a fucking microwave oven out of the deal. It was a good thing. Now, I've talked about the broken window fallacy before in my podcast, my brilliant, brilliant podcast. It was an anarchy moment, as I recall, and I think the title is something along the lines of the broken window fallacy is not a fallacy if you replace broken windows. But of course, Maddox Dick sort of half-heartedly attempted to explain to Maddox the concept of opportunity cost and the fact that if you're not using money to replace things that were broken, you can use that money for other things. But Maddox, is, you know, as much as I agree, like Maddox and I agree on bicycles. Maddox is a bicycler like I am. And he's, he's got some great arguments about bicycling. And Dick is this, I, I don't ride a bicycle. Riding bicycles for gay people. So anyhow, the great thing about the podcast, not this podcast, that podcast, the, the biggest problem in the universe, is that there's times when I agree with both of them, there's times I disagree with both of them, and regardless of where you're at, it's hilariously funny as fuck, regardless of how much they're pissing me off with their stupid-ass ideas. Anyhow, so I'm considering if I want to refute Maddox's, because his arguments are the typical state of shit. You know, again, it's like, well, yeah, World War II, some people died, but we got radar and microwave ovens. Holy fuck, you know. And Dick was trying to point out, yes, but had we not had the war, those things might have been invented sooner. You don't know that. And Maddox is like, yeah, we don't know that. So that makes that means I'm right. Well, no, God, because he doesn't understand opportunity cost at all. He has no fucking understanding of opportunity cost. It's pretty clear. There was something else. What the fuck was I going to say? As I was talking, something else popped into my brain about one of Maddox's dumbass arguments. And of course, he pulled out the standard. The world, the world War II got America out of the Depression. Oh, God. Moron. Anyway, all right. Let me let that go. Let me move on. Before I forget, let me go on to this. Shit. Over on Aaron Cleary's website, he posted a link. I might as well just find it now because i got to put the link in the show notes. He posted a link to a video done by some individual who is in the MGTOW slash Virgin Toe community. And I'm not saying this person is a Virgin Toe. I don't know anything about this person. This is the first of his videos that I've ever watched. All that you need to know is where the fuck is it? Here we go. Found it. You should go watch this video, is what we're getting to. Don't play the video. Thank you. This is... The channel is... And I'll put the link in the show notes. I will actually remember. The channel is... Marcus, that's his name. The guy's name is Marcus. His channel is Groundwork for the Metaphysics of MGTO. Anyhow, this video is about the wall. Not The Wall by Pink Floyd. The wall as in the wall that women hit. So before I discovered the manosphere and started reading all of this stuff, I had common sense. I know it's hard to believe for some of you, but it's true. You know, there were certain things I inherently understood. I understood that men are primarily attracted to women because of what women look like. Women are primarily attracted to men because of how much money they have. Therefore, as men get older and make more money and accumulate more money, they become more attractive to women. As women get older and become less attractive, men are less attracted to women. Now, to me, even even like back in my virgin toe days, this is a this is a episode of probably anarchy moment that I need to do, but I'm just gonna tease you with this right now. I was standing around thinking to myself because I do this. I do this thing called thinking. I do it a lot. It's something you guys don't do. That's why you're statist. And I was reviewing some of my belief systems 
in my brain, looking at my worldviews and looking for holes and flaws and all this other stuff, something that you're not capable of doing because as a statist, you have the same worldview you had when you were eight years old, right? When you're eight years old, you're like, oh, my mommy and daddy just give me stuff for free and I don't really understand where it comes from and I don't care, I just want more stuff. And as a statist, your thought process is, oh, Mitt Romney and Hussein Obama give me stuff for free and I don't really understand where it comes from, but I don't really care because I just want more stuff because I only care about myself. So you have the worldview of an eight-year-old because you can't self-examine. So I was self-examining in the context of girls and it occurred to me that I was a virgin toe before virgin toe was ever cool. Many, many, many years ago, many years ago, I absolutely hated women. Like when you listen to some of these mig toes, virgin toes, perma virgins, whatever you want to call them, as a Matt Forney term, the perma virgins, I, st I still love perma virgin. Yeah, again, I love women. I adore women. Went drinking with a woman yesterday. Randy, dude, she did this shit to me again. But this is ever, I'm telling you, she's trying to fucking get me drunk and rape me. Every time we go out, she's like, oh, I can't finish my drink. You're going to have to finish it for me. So I, like, I didn't get plastered. <laughs> Not like I was that other day when, when I tell that guy that, when that guy was like, hey, you're talking too loud. The old people are offended. That was pretty drunk. I wasn't plastered. I was like, will you please just drink your own fucking beer and stop making me drink? She's lucky she's cute. That's the only way she gets away with this shit. There's nothing I hate worse than people giving me free alcohol. Yeah, she also bought. I know, see, I'm telling you, she wants she wants the cock, man. Anyhow, the fuck was I talking? Oh, virgin toe. So yeah, I love girls, but that doesn't mean I'm blind to the faults of women, okay? And that doesn't mean I can't call women out on their bullshit, and that doesn't mean I can't recognize that 99% of women are completely fucking worthless and should be avoided at all cost. There's a 1% out there that's good quality human beings. Now, back in the day, I was a virgin toe before it was cool. I hated women. Abs I was not, again, if you've listened to this podcast for a while, you'll know, as I've said before, virtually all of my friends are women. I have like one good friend who is a man. Everybody else, it's all women. Because I love chicks. Now, this is a contrast to, I don't know, was it 15 years ago? You didn't, you did, this was before, well, obviously, this is before you knew me. Because I'm talking to Randy, not you, the listener. I mean, before you and I met, darling, I was the fucking perma virgin. I hated women, and the reason I hated women was because. I had never fucked a woman. I had never seen a woman naked except in magazines. When I was your age, we didn't have the internet. We had to actually look at magazines to see naked girls. Which means you had to steal the magazines from somebody who had them. Because, you know, when you're 16 years old, when I was 16 years old, I could get away with buying liquor, but I couldn't buy any porn magazines. Mostly because I only had a limited amount of money and I'd rather spend it on Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill, which, oh God, I don't know how I survived those days. I don't know how my stomach survived Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill. I, I'm, I was counting on my fingers. I was at number three. I have no fucking clue what I'm talking about. What was I... Ta oh, yes. I was a perma virgin. I'd never seen a girl naked except in magazines. I had no idea how to talk to girls. I was terrified of girls. No. Just... I, just, I was that. And so now when I look at the MGTOW typers, it's pretty easy... I'm not going to say I'm perfect at it, but I feel pretty confident about my ability to distinguish the perma-virgin virgin toes from the actual legitimate mig toes. Because, just like with everything else, those of, if you've listened to this cast, you've been down this road with me before, because just like everything else, I've been there. I've been a perma-virgin. I've been a liberal Democrat, I've been a conservative Republican, I've been a Christian, I've been a Southern Baptist, I've been an atheist, I've been a Satanist, I've been a right-wing minarchist, I've been a liberty... You know, again, I, I've been there, I've done that, 
my fucking worldview has evolved as I've gone through life. I don't still have the same worldview I had when I was eight years old the way you do. And so because I have been a virgin toe and because I have gotten better and gotten over it and I'm now an anarcho-capitalist who can look at women and recognize the good and the bad in them and separate this stuff and think critically, you know, I can look at MGTOW movement stuff and I can pretty quickly ascertain, okay, is this person actually somebody with a thought process or is this just a fucking virgin toe? I think I just actually did the podcast. Now I don't have to do the podcast. I just did so That was a teaser. That was a 27-minute teaser for what might be an upcoming episode of the podcast. <laughs> God damn it. Anyway. Oh, shit. Randy, what did I just do? Are we still recording? Did I fuck that up? See, this is why you should let me have computer control. No? It's good? All right. I'm going to take your word for it. If it's not, you're going to have to kill me. Nope, hang on. Hit the hit the select. Oh yeah, now now we'll really fuck it up. Select. Oh yeah, now I've broken it. <laughs> Are we still recording? All right, take computer control. Take take away from me. Get it out of here. Anyway, Marcus put out this video. It's called the Wall. And so anyhow, I had this intuitive understanding of what the MGTO. Manosphere movement calls the wall before I'd ever heard of the wall in that context, yada, yada, yada. That's where that was supposed to be going. I'll put the link in. You should go watch this video. It's about 30 minutes long, 36 minutes long. It's, it's really good. His analysis of... Because again, you know, oh, well, women hit the wall. They get old and ugly. But there's more to it than that. There really is. On a surface level, there's not. Again, that's just intuitive. Women get old, they become less attractive, men don't give a shit. But he takes all of this. Because you throw into this, women say things like, where are all the good guys gone? And then you've got the cock carousel. And Marcus takes all of this and ties it together in a very coherent and interesting philosophical thesis as for what exactly it's like you know and all of the dynamics behind the actual event of a woman hitting the wall and what her response is to the fact that Right, you mean you're, so you're a woman and you're you're 14 years old and then you're 16 years old and then you're 18 and you're 22 and there's all these men paying attention to you and you're getting all of these resources from men and he goes into the reasons why and th this was brilliant he goes into his thesis on why women ride the cock carousel and it's a brilliant fucking thesis yeah and then as you get older and you start becoming less attractive, men stop paying attention to you, and the wall happens. So anyhow, it's a great video. You should check it out. It's well worth your time. I'm going to put the link to it, and it's, I need to move on. Next up on this show. Speaking of women, let me throw this out real quick. <clears throat> the previous edition of Stating the Obvious, I talked about the woman who was complaining about the Mormons at the 4th of July festival and saying that the Mormons should not be allowed to be there. And of course, this woman's tolerance, diversity, political correctness, multiculturalism, yada, 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 like all left-wing statists. I was with her at another event, and she smoked a cigarette, and took her cigarette butt, we're at a garden, you know, garden with flowers and plants. And she took her cigarette butt and threw it on the ground in the garden because she couldn't be bothered to carry that heavy ass cigarette butt to a trash can. That's statism. That's multiculturalism. That's diversity. She believes in global warming. She's all about recycling. She threw her cigarette butt on the fucking ground and walked away from it. Well, the great one to the rescue. 
It took a couple of comments, but I finally shamed her enough that she went back and picked it up and threw it away. Statist shaming. You know, it's like Return of Kings. They have fat shaming week. We should have, in the anarcho-capitalist sphere, we should have statist shaming week. We should just shame every statist around us. Statist around us? Yeah, yeah. That, that. There, every statist around us. Every statist around us. Every statist around us. It's like a tongue twister vocal warm up. Every statist around us. It also covers up while I'm getting my notes ready. Every statist around us. Every statist around us. I need to mark my place in the book. The book. Now, let us move on to the book. Oh, here's another one. Stop telling your kids they have talent. So I run into somebody else, and this person's like, Yeah, I have this video of my kids, and they're singing. And he shows the video, and cigarette butt girl, cigarette butt, we're looking at the video, and cigarette butt girl, who hates Mormons, is like, oh, their voices are so wonderful, they're so cute. And I'm listening to this, and it's like, they're not. They're just little, like, eight-year-old, all eight-year-old kids have voices that sound like that. They're, they're not, they're, they're not great singers. There's no fucking talent going on here. And she's like, oh, they're so cute. Oh, they're, oh they have such wonderful voices. I'm going to throw my cigarette butt on the ground and walk away from it because I care about the environment so much. And those, those Mormons, they shouldn't be allowed at public events because I don't agree with their religion. And I'm multicultural and tolerant and diverse. Oh, my God. God, I fucking hate you people. I really do. Have I mentioned that I hate statist? If I haven't, I'm letting you know right now. Alright, I need to mark that for notes. I need to mark that for show notes. Okay. We'll come along uh, and we'll get to all that later. Alright, the book. Here we go. I am currently reading. I'm eh, pretty close to the end. I am reading Marissa Meyer and the Fight to Save Yahoo by Nicholas Carlson. It's a very good book. Again, if if this is the sort of book that you like, if you like reading books about you know corporations and CEOs and the stuff that goes on behind the scenes and all that other sort of stuff, it's a very good book. I highly recommend it. If you don't like reading books about that kind of stuff, then you're not going to like it. Don't waste your time. The first thing I want to say is reading this, again, you see the statism and the subservient slave mentality that so many people have. Reading through this book about all the CEOs that came before Marissa Meyer, all these people come in, they did some good shit, they did some bad shit, they got kicked out eventually or replaced or left or whatever. And I mean, this is how it works virtually all the time at any company that exist. Any kind of corporation, anyway. Just what's interesting is reading how every time a new CEO comes in, how all the employees are sitting here thinking, oh, this is the person who's going to save us. Right? Like in this book, when Marissa Meyer took over, they, the Yahoo employees printed up posters modeled on the Obama Hope poster, you know, that you you're got sick of seeing, with her face on it that says Hope on it. And it's just another reinforcement of how everybody out there, the 99%, <clears throat> excuse me, hold on. I was saying, and then we got, we got dogs barking on that side of the studio. We got the motherfucking weed eater on that side of the studio, and the train just went by. I swear to God. This is the problem with having a non-soundproof recording studio in the middle of town. Of course, I close the windows, but I just can't do that. Because I like fresh air. I know, it's the only recording studio on the planet Earth that has windows, and I open the windows while we're recording. I don't give a shit. Fuck you. Anyway, the hell is I talking about? Oh, yes, the Messiah Complex. Everybody, well, not everybody, the 99% are always sitting around saying, oh, there's this one person who's going to come save us, right? Marissa Meyer is going to come to Yahoo and save the company. Right, you mean like all the CEOs before her who fucked up. 
right? This whole thing with Obama. Oh, we're going to elect Obama. He's going to save the country. This, in, this desire you people have for a Messiah figure, for this one person who can come in and fix everything. The problem is this person does not exist. Right-wing statists have the same thing, right? Jesus, he came down from on high and he died for your sins, which I always find is odd because if Jesus died for my sins, why the fuck do I still have sins, right? Jesus died for your sins, he's going to save you, unless, of course, you're a faggot or you're not the same religion as me or you're an atheist, in which case, then you're going to go to hell. See, then you're going to burn in hell. But other than that, Jesus came down and saved everybody. The fact is, Marissa Meyer is just like Hussein Obama, is just like Adolf Hitler. Because we got to get Hitler in here somewhere, right? Every human being alive, from Adolf Hitler to me, has done good things and bad things. We've all done things right that worked out well. We've all done things stupidly that turned out to be mistakes. And when you read these books about these corporate goings-ons and entities and everything that's going on, and, you know, and I'm reading this now, every, every time a new CEO shows up, it's like, now nah, everybody thought this guy was going to fix it. Everybody thought this girl was going to fix it. It's like, Jesus Christ, how many times do you people have to go through this process before you realize that there is no Messiah? There is no person out there who can fix everything for you. Right, the people who say, well, Obama, he's gonna fix the economy. I've done this spiel before, but I just wanna do it again briefly. Fix the economy. Anytime, any, it's not just Obama, right? Every president is gonna fix the economy. Everybody wants, they're gonna fix. Remember, the economy of the United States is the actions, the cumulative, the total, the net effect, the result of the actions of seven billion people on the planet Earth. That is what the economy of the United States is. You build something in China, well, did they build it or not? Did somebody in America buy it? Then somebody in the United States has it. Does somebody else in the United States buy it? Does somebody over in Germany buy it? Does somebody in Brazil not buy it? What happens on the internet? What do people do? Which bar do people go to? What food? All of the, every, the economy of the United States is the actions or inactions of every fucking human on the planet Earth. And the idea that you're going to elect this Messiah figure president and that the president is going to fix that is the fucking depths of stupidity. Like James Cameron with a fucking deep sea submersible could not go deep enough to find as much stupidity as you have if you think a person can fix the economy. And even on a level such as a corporation, if I remember correctly, Yahoo, in this book, it says there's something around, was it 1,500 or 15,000? We'll find out because I'm going to get to it. But there's all these employees. The idea that this one person will come in as CEO and just magically fix the actions and inactions of all these employees. Like, at what point do you people take any responsibility for yourself? And the answer, of course, is never because you're statist and you have the worldview of an eight-year-old. Okay, where are we at on time? Thank you. Let's read. 14 to 16. I'm not going to read. I'm not. There's not a whole lot I'm pulling out of this book. That's why I've waited until 30 minutes into the cast to start talking about it. In theory, this should go pretty quick. Again, if you listen to the podcast, you know I'm a lying motherfucker. It's not going to go quick. All right. Where do I start? Okay. 
Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so. Marissa Meyer rolled out a, we'll call it employee evaluation program, which is actually very similar to the one I had to deal with when I worked at Colorado State University. We have to grade every, we had to grade everybody one, two, or three. And of course there were quotas. The quotas were not spoken, but the quotas certainly did exist. Marissa Meyer rolled out a system where you grade everybody one, two, three, four, or five. And there were, in her, in her system, there were very explicit quotas about how many people could go into each of these gradings. And of course, if you're a one or a two, you may or may not get a raise. If you're a one enough times, you might get fired. And only fours and fives get raises, yada, yada, yada. Or something to that effect. I'm simplifying greatly. But the point is, I want to read this to you because for those of you whose greatest aspiration in life is to work for a corporation, and sure, there's some benefits to working for corporations. I mean, especially if you're a woman, you got safe zones, the corporation's your boyfriend, it takes care of you. But there are some downsides to working for corporations. One of them is having idiots grade you on a scale of one to five and not just grade you but actually have to put you into a specific place due to a quota. As 2013 rolled on, Meyer's system made life particularly difficult for Yahoo's middle managers. It was hard to get talented people to work in the same group. Not only did people not want to compete against other talented employees, I had teamwork because we're all about teamwork. They also worried that if they got transferred in the middle of a quarter, they'd whiff on their goals, get a mere achieve, and lose out on any chance for a raise any time in the next 12 months. Workers would prioritize tasks that got them closer to their personal goals over doing anything else. This made sense. Collaboration, collaborating and helping out on a project wasn't going to get you closer to an exceeds, and that was just a stupid thing to do. The worst part was, every quarter, managers would guide their teams towards collective goals, and then, even if all those goals were met, they had to single out a few people and tell them they had missed expectations. Occasionally, a middle manager would quietly rebel and file a packet of QPRs to Yahoo Human Resources that listed each employee as an achieves or better. But HR would kick the packet back and tell the manager to get their calibrations right. Calibrations is apparently a politically correct word in corporate speak for quotas. That, that was commentary. Someone always had to, quote, occasionally miss, even if no one ever missed. So again, if, if, you're, you know, if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to work for a corporation, this is the kind of environment you're going to be in. This is, if, you're, if you want to work for corporations, you really should read books like this in order to get a glimpse into what your life might be like. This is for those of you who are young and don't have real jobs yet. One ugly part of the process every quarter was a series of so-called calibration meetings. In calibration meetings, manager would, managers would gather with their bosses and review all the employees under their watch. Then the managers and their bosses would adjust the scores of those employees so the department as a whole had the right amount of people in each bucket. 10% in greatly exceeds, 25% in exceeds, and so forth. In other words, quotas for performance. Again, at CSU, we had the same thing. Let's say that all of my employees in my department happened to be where I would rate them at a three. I'd send that to HR, they'd bounce that shit right back. It can't happen. Your, this is the thing about working for a corporation. Your individual performance will never be completely fairly evaluated just in the sense of who you are. There's always going to be all of these comparisons, right? What is your race? What is your gender? What are the people around you doing? What new fucking program has a CEO rolled out? All of this shit, you're never going, no, I'm gonna say never. You're gonna have a hard time succeeding on your own merits because there's always going to be something around you that's going to affect you, like this system is affecting these employees. And remember, this system was implemented by Marissa Meyer, a sensitive woman who, you know, is all 
understanding and going to save everybody and all this other shit. The employees were very pissed off about this. According to the book, again, I don't, I haven't never worked at Yahoo. I don't know anybody who works at Yahoo. I'm not stalking Marissa Meyer and reading her email. I, everything I know about this is from this book right here. All right, what went down at these meetings was not what Meyer had intended. Ah, uh, yeah, see, it's, it's not what she intended, but as a statist, she doesn't understand that her intentions don't matter. The only thing that matters is her actions. She may have intended, I mean, she intended for this to be a system to get people out of the company who weren't doing their job. That's understandable. And let me just say too, too, before we move on, I'm not completely vilifying Marissa Meyer. I'm going to give her shit where she deserves it, but in, <clears throat> as we go forward here, I'm also going to defend her. Again, Marissa Meyer, she's just like Adolf Hitler. She's done some smart things that were really good. She's done some dumb things that were really bad. Because everybody, even the most fucking militant, statist, feminazi cunt, everybody is human. Even Adolf Hitler. We're all human. We all do good stuff. We all do bad stuff. I just call it as I see it. I defend you when you should be defended. I attack you when you should be attacked. Right now, we're attacking Marissa Meyer for her dumbass fucking employee evaluation program, which even to somebody like me, who's never been the CEO of a multi-billion dollar international corporation, even I can recognize that this is really fucking stupid. Really fucking stupid. But then again, and I'm a head shoved up my ass from going through my entire life, having people tell me how wonderful I am because I have a pair of titties and blonde hair. I love reading this book. It's like Marissa Meyer and her Hollywood movie star good looks. Yeah, that's the only, huh? how, many, how many people she fucked at Google to get where she was. Both kinds of fucking. Anyway, let me get back to reading before I actually do run out of time because we all know how much I love to run out of time. What went down these meetings were not what Meyer had intended. Meyer wanted employers, bleh, Meyer wanted employees to be rated objectively against the goals they'd agreed on with their managers at the beginning of every quarter. What happened instead was that the managers would sit there and look at an employee that needed to fit into a particular bucket and try to think of reasons why they fit there. And exactly, this is what happens. If you, when you create a system, okay, we'll have people set their goals and then we'll grade them one to five based on how well they meet their goals. Okay, that's legit. But then as soon as you introduce a quota where you say 5% have to be a one, you know, 10% have to be a two, 25% have to be a three, whatever. As soon as you put a quota system in there, You've destroyed the entire purpose. You can no longer objectively rate the employees if there is a fucking quota for the ratings. I can say this from first fucking hand experience at CSU. We had, as I just told you, we had the same thing. There was an unspoken quota. If you sent in your shit, everybody was a one, it would come right back. If everybody's a two, right, if everybody's a three, right, you better have some ones and you better have some threes and you better have some twos and it better be the right balance. If you got more threes than ones and twos combined, that shit's coming back. It's a, You cannot rate your employees objectively when you have a quota system. But of course, Marissa Meyer is a woman and she doesn't understand math because math is part of the patriarchy. Math was invented to oppress blonde-haired, blue-eyed women like Marissa Meyer, who, if it just weren't for the patriarchy, would probably be president of the United States right now. All right. Sometimes the reasons, sometimes the reason would be a political one. Managers would strike bargains, agreeing to rate certain employees in one another's groups higher and employees in some other manager's group lower, so that the curve fit. Sometimes the reason would be more superficial. That employee ate lunch with the right people or could hold a conversation with the boss in the hallway exceeds. This one shuffles around and kept to himself, occasionally misses. Maya herself attended calibration meetings where these kinds of arbitrary judgments happened. She knew about it and didn't give a fuck because she knew that quotas would cause that kind of behavior. Fucking lawnmower. God damn it. There's like 
the, the grass out there is barely even growing. Oh, but that's right. We got to get some more fucking pollutants into the atmosphere. Much as I hate doing it, I'm closing the window. Lawnmower is just sitting there running while the guy walks around. All right. Anyway, god damn it, I fucking, I really fucking hate lawnmowers and weed eaters, and, and my ultimate nemesis, the motherfucking leaf blower. Let me blow particles of dog shit into the air because, oh yeah, global warming. All right. Anyway, fuck. <laughs> Where the hell was I? The senior executives who reported to Meyer, known collectively as her E-staff, and called L2s, level 2s, which, <laughs> I'm a level 2. Oh, it just sounds so wonderful working for a corporation. You can be a level 2. Would join her in a meeting room called Fish Food. That's fish, P-H-I-S-H. -H. Oh, that's so cute. I just, when corporations try to make cute culture, I just, I find it nauseating, right? It's like, oh, you know, this, this concentration camp's not so bad. If we just put up some wallpaper and some wind chimes, then it wouldn't be that bad for the Jews to be here. All right, anyway, now I'm comparing corporations to concentration camps. That might be a little bit of a stretch, but it does the same thing to your soul. All right. Join her in a room called Fish Food on the executive floor of the Building D in Yahoo Sunnyvale campus. There they would go over the names and ratings of the <clears throat> L3 and L4 executives. There would be a bunch of people sitting around a table holding spreadsheets of names and ratings. If the name of an L3 that was unfamiliar to Meyer came up, the rating would usually stick. But if she knew the name of a person and could recall an interaction, that person's rating would go up or down based on how that relatively trivial interaction had gone. So in other words, Marissa Meyer made her fucking evaluations of employees based on whether or not she enjoyed having a conversation in the hallway with them. Because of course, as you've heard me say before, women are entirely emotion driven. So remember, when you work at a company and you get a new CEO and CEO is a woman, this is not to say that CEOs with penises are perfect. This is not to say that CEOs who have penises never make flawed decisions. Okay, All I'm saying is when you get a CEO with a vagina, you need to recognize that at that moment, everything that happens in the future of your company is going to be based on emotion. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's okay. Sometimes that works. That is not always bad. But when it comes to doing employee evaluations, upon which people's having or not having a job, getting or not getting a raise is dependent, making those decisions based on your fucking emotional reaction to having a conversation with somebody in the hallway At one such meeting on October 26, 2012, the name Vivek Sharman Char Char came up. At that point, Sharman was working with Meyer on a major redesign of Yahoo Mail, a project codenamed Quattro. Several hundred million people use Yahoo Mail every month, and Quattro represented a major turning point for the product, but that's not what finally determined Char. Sharman's, Sharma's, Sharma's rating at the meeting. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the guy's name. At L2, Yahoo Chief Marketing Officer Kathy Savitt, another vagina, said, quote, He just annoys me. I don't want to be around him. Unquote. Again, emotion. That is, he annoys me. I don't want to be around him. That's your emotional reaction to somebody else it has nothing to do with his ability to write code for Yahoo Mail. That has nothing to do with his code writing abilities or anything else. That is Kathy Savitt's emotional reaction. Everything in that sentence, he just annoys me, I don't want to be around him. 
all of that is happening between her ears. That is her emotional response to something else. That's all it is. Savit didn't really need to be around Sharma. <clears throat> Hold on. Actually did do vocal warm-ups today, believe it or not. Savit. <clears throat> all right. <laughs> yeah, let me just cough all over the microphone. I still, it just kills me. Randy, what the fuck are the, how is it that I can cough away from the microphone and it gets the sound better than when I fucking speak into the microphone? There's some kind of, I swear to God, they fucking design microphones specifically to pick up people coughing and not people talking. I think that's what's going on. All right, anyway, enough of me bitching about microphones and audio dynamics. Are you shitting me? Oh, God. All right, we're not going to get through the book in this podcast. I guess I should have started sooner. Oh, well, never mind. Hey, there's going to be a part two where I talk more about this book. Imagine that. All right. <clears throat> Savit didn't really need to be around Sharma much as he worked in Yahoo's product organization and had relatively little interaction with marketing. But Meyer agreed with Savit. She docked Sharma's rating, which inevitably decreased his take-home pay for the year. In January 2013, Sharma left Yahoo for a senior position at Disney. And there it is. <clears throat> that makes my point, right? You want to work at a corporation, you need to understand that you're putting your future in the sense of your work future, your career, your pay, your opportunities, you're putting this in the hands of CEOs and middle managers with small penises and all the stupid cunts that work in the HR department. And God forbid, if your corporation gets some kind of shit fest evaluation system like this one where you have quotas and where your performance is determined by the emotional response that women have to you i mean you're fucked <clears throat> many people in the manosphere have written about this about you know going to the workplace and what you have to do to survive if you're going to have a corporate job where there are women working there. I, I read one just recently. I want to say it might have been on Return of Kings, but I can't remember. But you know, basically the guy was going through this thing. You know, you got to stifle your opinions. You got to not get involved in these people's problems. You know, these, all these things you've got to do. I've talked about this a gazillion times in the past. Remember, in addition to the fact that women are driven entirely by emotion, you also have to remember that women view work completely differently than we men do. We men look at our job, our work, as a place where we go to do things so we can get money so we can leave work and do stuff we enjoy doing with people we like. While women, of course, look at, in addition to seeing the government as their husband and their provider, the welfare, the WIC, the food stamps, yada, 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 women see credit to Davis Aruni or Arini. I, I think I've been mispronouncing his name like virtually every time I say it. It's either Arini, Aruni, Arini. I think Arini is right. I think I always say Aruni. Davis J. Arini. Find his YouTube channel. Find the video. The corp What is it? Corporation as the boyfriend. Something of that ni nature. He nails it in that video. Absolutely nails it. Women see the corporation as their boyfriend who sends them places and buys them nice stuff, women see their co-workers as their friends. So for women, they don't go to work to make money so they can leave work and do things they enjoy doing with people they like. Women go to work to do things they like doing with people they like. Women see their co-workers, the people who work for them and the people they work for and the people they work with, as their friends in their social network. And the disadvantage of this, and I'm not saying, there are there some advantages to that mindset? I'm sure there are. But I don't give a fuck because the biggest disadvantage is something just like this. Marissa Meyer and this other dumb cunt, Kathy Savitt, think that Sharma is there to be their friend. And because they just didn't like him, well, we're going to fuck him over financially and we're going to fuck him over in the sense of his job opportunities. Well, because he's just not 
my friend enough. That's what you're setting yourself up for when you get some kind of a corporate job. So just be, again, not saying, all right, don't go work for a corporation. If some corporation shows up and they're going to throw 600000 at you for a year to sit in a cubicle and do something, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying go in with your eyes open and be aware that the office politics, however bad you may think office politics are, whatever your experiences are with office politics, understand that the reality is that they're much worse than you can ever imagine. Again, four years at CSU as a management type person, dealing with human resources, you know, having the HR people tell me, well, yes, it's completely okay for people to hire their friends. Not, not making this up. Went to HR and said, you, do you realize that our new director is basically just hiring people she's friends with? And the HR person who's in charge of us looks at me and says, well, yeah, that's what we do. She's like, I hired my friends right here in HR. She's like, that guy, I hired him. He's a friend of mine. That girl, I hired her. She's my friend from where we went to college together. And I mean, this was perfectly natural to her. The idea that you should be qualified to do a job other than being friends with the person doing the hiring is completely foreign to her. She had no idea that there's anything wrong with this. In her world, you hire your friends. And of course, now, if you're getting the job because you're friends with somebody at the corporation, you're in, on the other side of this. And I get that. Again, if you can get a six-figure job at a corporation, a bunch of stock options and all this other shit, because you're friends with somebody, <laughs> go, go for it. I, I am not saying you're a bad person for taking advantage of that. You should. I would. Somebody called me up and said, hey, great one. Remember me? We went to college together. Hey, I'm going to give you this great job with all this money. I'm like, fuck yeah. Where yeah, I'll be there tomorrow. That's what you're getting into. I also want to throw out here's something I learned from this book that I did not know. Yahoo had the opportunity in its past to have bought Google, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. All of those deals were blown and fucked up. And in all fairness, I will point out they were blown and fucked up by CEOs who had penises. They were not fucked up by CEOs who had vaginas. Again, not saying well, the CEO with a penis is perfect and the CEO with a vagina can never do anything right. Just saying, man. Corporate life. Read books like this one, Marissa Meyer and the Fight to Save Yahoo, in order to get a look at what corporate existence is really like. All right, I'm going to talk about this book some more in the next episode. And I haven't forgotten about all the Roosh stuff either. I'm going to be back talking about some more Roosh posts because he's got some other good stuff that I want to discuss in depth. All right, happy Monday, y'all. Have fun. Took the lawnmower and shoved it up that guy's ass.